Good morning. This morning we're going to be continuing in our study on Galatians and in this particular section Paul has been very concerned about wrong beliefs of the Galatians and Paul spends quite a bit of time explaining the difference between the promise and the law and the consequences of those differences because the Galatians had some serious misunderstandings. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I read uh, the words of a song called Morning Prayer. And I've since realized just how appropriate it is for us. And I'd like this to be our prayer this morning as we come to God's word. And I'm going to read um, parts of it again. As I sit down before you this morning with the Bible in front of me here, I pray that you'll help me to listen and to understand all that I hear. Protect me from words of the liar, deceptions that seem there from you, meanings you never intended. Give me wisdom to see what is true. Wash me with your living water. Feed me with your living word. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to do what I've heard. And may that be our prayer this morning that God would protect us from deceptions and meanings that he doesn't intend. In, he, uh, in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 15, Paul starts and he says, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Here's an illustration. Though it's only a man's covenant, yet if it's confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He doesn't say into seeds, plural, but oh, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. God had made a promise to Abraham that in his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And God confirmed that in Christ. Paul makes the point that subsequent covenants do not override this covenant. And as we look around us today, we find that we've still got the same problem. We've still got people who are thinking that a subsequent covenant or an idea overrides that covenant. There's the JWs who insist on obedience to our law. And there's the Mormons and the Muslims saying that their prophets have superseded Christ and, the, and his promise. And today there are many so-called prophets and apostles who are claiming authority for themselves. And we need to be aware of that. We need to be allowing God to show us what there is and we need to be searching the scriptures to make sure that what they're saying is true. In verse 18, he says, For if the inheritance is of the law, it's no longer a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. If you receive something for what you've done, it's a payment, not a promise. God's promise is not, if you do this or that, then I'll give you this. God's promise was given to Abraham after he had faith. And there was no ifs, buts, or maybes. There was no requirement of certain works. In Romans 4 and 4, it says, Now to him who works, the wages are, counted, are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So then as Paul says in verse 19, so what purpose then does the law serve? And the next little bit is interesting. He said, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now, last week, Frank went into quite a bit of explaining about the flesh. 
And he also mentioned about the law. And the law is mentioned many times in today's passage. And when we think of the law, we think of things like the Ten Commandments, where we are told what not to do. However, when we look at what Paul's talking about in this passage, it's more what he has to do rather than what he not to do. And Paul makes a few comments that indicate he has a specific law in mind. I'd like just to look at a few things with regard to the law. A few things that, that show up here. The first is in verse 17. The law was added 430 years after the promise to Abraham. If the law was to identify sin, does that mean that from creation to 430 years after Abraham, nobody knew what sin was? I don't think so. Did God flood the world and punish people for things they didn't know were wrong? I don't think so. People knew what sin was before the law came. Does this mean that the people weren't aware of their transgressions before the law? Or the number of transgressions was increasing? In verse 19, it says, The law was added because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And in verse 16, he says, your seed, which is Christ. So the law was only there from 430 years after Abraham to the time of Christ. The law that Paul's talking about was not applicable before or after. However, the law that was given to by God to Moses required many offerings and sacrifices and feasts and as we look at these that are mentioned in the law we see that many of them probably all of them are pictures of christ they're pointing to what god was going to do through christ to deal with the problem of transgressions to die for our sins after jesus had died these pictures are no longer needed they had fulfilled their purpose and these offerings and sacrifices were only until Jesus came. And God was pointing forward to the fulfillment of his promise. As Paul was comparing the law and the promises, it appears that the Galatians had considered that they could be justified by either one. However, being made aware of sin is not a means of justification, rather it's more the opposite. It makes you aware of your failings and the penalty. Unfortunately, even today, there are people who think that by doing a lot of good things, that can make up for some of the bad things they do. And as I thought about that, I thought, hmm. So if you've got a doctor who does surgery and he's a really good doctor and over the course of say 10 years he's saved 50 people's lives does that mean he can go out and kill 10 people and because he's saved 50 lives those 10 people don't count that he's killed i don't think so however we have this idea that if we do a lot of good things that counteracts the bad which contradicts what the Bible teaches us, doesn't it? But Paul, hang on a minute. Paul is talking here about justifying. Now, we sometimes use the word justify and we talk about justifying what we do. And um, I think it's significant that we understand the difference between what we think of when we talk about justifying and what God talks about. When we do something wrong, we know it's wrong. And others know that it's wrong too. But it's something that we think needs to be done, even though it's wrong. 
So we give a reasoned explanation of why it's right to do it, even though we know it's wrong. And we convince ourselves and try to convince others that it's right to do something that's wrong. We justify our actions. But that's not what God does. He doesn't take something that is wrong and change it to make it right. Rather, God completes the process of justice. Justification is connected to justice. And we need to keep that in mind, that what God does is justice. God doesn't, even though he's God, he can't just come along and say, oh, yeah, he's a nice bloke, I'll just wipe out everything he's done wrong. God doesn't do that because it's not consistent with his person. God is just, and justice must be carried out. And God completes the process of justice. God looks at us and he identifies the sin in our lives and finds us guilty and he declares the penalty, which is death. And we've got no way of dealing with that ourselves, do we? Uh, but for justice to be done, the penalty must be paid. And it's interesting that through the Old Testament, God continually showed the children of Israel that the penalty for sin is death. And there are millions and millions of lambs that died because of sin. To try and get it through to their heads and try to get it through our heads, that the penalty of sin must be paid. The penalty of sin can never be cancelled or wiped away. But then God himself pays the penalty for our sin. He died for us. And justice is completed. And because justice is completed, we are justified. And the record on our lives now reads, paid in full. We are made right with God because justice has been satisfied. How different that is to our justifying. We try to get out of admitting our own guilt and paying the penalty for it. God is completely innocent, but he pays the penalty for my sin. And the amazing thing is, justice is not something that existed before God. It's not something that controls God that God's answerable to justice is something that God himself created and then he fulfilled the requirements of justice in verse 20 he says now a mediator does not mediate for one only but God is one is the law then against the promises of God certainly not for if there had been a law which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. The law is not in opposition to the promise. The law points to the promise. And it reveals the need for the promise. And rather than giving life, the law gives wages. And the wages of sin is death. The law reveals that the need of the, for the promise which comes by faith, not by works. In Romans 3, 19 and 20, it says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth should be stopped and that the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And in verse 22, he says, but the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. It's interesting that Paul does not say the law has confined all under sin, but rather the scripture has confined all under sin. We are all under sin. 
before the law and during the law. And we all sin. The next few verses, Paul repeats the idea a couple of times to try and illustrate it. In verses 23 to 25, he said, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which might, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. And with those verses, we need to be very careful and understand exactly who he's talking about. Paul gives a couple of illustrations to try and explain and help us to understand it. And in chapter 4, verse 1, is his first illustration. And he says, now I say that an heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. This was a part of their culture. In Paul's time, a child, even though he was the heir of a, an estate, he had no more authority than a slave. In fact, the child was under the authority and control of a slave. A slave that was appointed by the father to supervise the child until they reached until they reached maturity. So that slave then represents the law, and the child represents the Jews before Christ. Um. Because he says the he says the the the, um, the slave was guardian and steward until the time appointed by the father. At that point, they were then recognised as sons, with all the rights of and authority of a son and heir. And then he explained it in the next couple of verses. Even so, we. When we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, the idea there of adoption is not the same as what we have here today. In our culture, uh, when you adopt somebody, it's usually somebody who may be an orphan and their parents are gone. And you are the parents on a bit of paper. For us as Christians, we are born again by God. We are not children of this parent and God writes a bit of paper and says, okay, you can be my son. The term adoption here relates to the situation where a child that he's talking about previously, who was the heir to an estate, that child, when they reach maturity, they become officially a son. And because of the problems with translating from Greek to English, um, the word adoption was used to try and get the the best idea but the adoption is different and in this passage here when we read it he says even so we we were under the law until the time of christ when he talks about this illustration here about the child being under the law that was only relating to the jews and those before that, those who were, as he was saying here about the child who was adopted officially, they became a son when the promise was revealed. 
It's a little bit like King Charles. All his life, he's been the heir to the throne, but never had the authority until the appointed day. In Hebrews chapter 11, we read about all those who had faith. And it goes right back to Abel. And in verse 39, it says, These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. In other words, the promise of God through the death of Christ was applied to everyone who has faith in Christ. Whether it's before Christ or after, everyone receives the promise at the time of Christ. Unfortunately, there have been times when people have said that for the Jews, their acceptance by God is faith plus works. And I'm sure that you've heard that. The Bible doesn't say that. In fact, the Bible says, by the works of the law, nobody, nobody will be justified by God. So if we say that it's faith plus works, then basically we're saying that there's not one single Jew who will ever, before Christ, be accepted by God, if that's the standard that we apply. But that's not what God requires. God says acceptance is by faith. Faith in what he was going to do through the Lord Jesus Christ in dying for us, dying for our sin. If we look at those verses and pull them apart a little bit, it said before faith came. That's not before our faith came. That's the definite article. It's before the faith came and it refers to Christ. Before Christ came, we, that's the Jews, were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith kept for Christ, who would afterwards be revealed. The law was our tutor, our guardian and stewards, until Christ came. And we're justified by faith, not by the works of the law, justified by faith. And after faith has come, after Christ has come, we are no longer under a tutor or under the law. If we consider those different ideas there, we can read verses 23 to 25. He says, but before Christ came, we, that's the Jews, were kept under the law, under guard by the law. Kept for Christ, who would afterwards be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor, that's the Jews, until Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Christ but after Christ has come we are no longer under a tutor and then he switches and the same in in, um, in chapter 4 after he has repeated this idea he switches and he, he says in uh, verse 26 he says for you he's referring to the Galatians for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And he said, there's no difference. Doesn't matter after Christ, it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew under the law. After Christ, there is no difference. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. He refers to the Galatians as you are all sons of Christ. 
sons of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. They didn't have to go through, and the same was us. We don't have to go through the childhood stage, the waiting to be recognized as sons. That was before Christ. After Christ died, they were immediately, and we were immediately, sons through faith in Christ because Jesus had already paid the penalty for our sins. The law was given to the Jews, but faith in Christ is to all of you. And you, because of the promise given to Abraham, you become Abraham's seed and an heir to the blessing of the promise. There is no waiting until Christ comes because he has already come. And then in verse 6, and also in verse 20, um, yeah, verse 6, he says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. When I looked at that, I found it was interesting because the word Abba is Aramaic. That's the language of the Jews. The word Father is Greek. And I thought, Paul here is, make, I think he's making the point that we are all one in Christ. He's putting together the Jews and the Greeks. Abba Father. Abba Father. We are all one in Christ. And as I was looking through this, I found another passage that Paul had written, which I think summarizes it quite well. In Romans chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? No. By the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. And since there is one God who would justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, is found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace but debt. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Paul is very concerned for the Galatians. And we need to remember that both the promise and the law were given by God. The Galatians didn't come up with this idea which was completely separate from the scriptures. They had used this idea of the law, which was, all, which was in the scriptures, but it was out of date. We need to remember that its expiry date was the death of Christ. The law was given to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. And Paul was very concerned 
for the Galatians. And he called them fools and bewitched. And we need to be very aware that we too can fall into the same trap of applying, of applying Old Testament truths and practices to us today without checking their conformity to New Testament teaching. And if you think that you're better than the Galatians or different from the Galatians, well, if you've got ancestry that goes back to Scotland or Ireland or France, there's a good chance you're related to the Galatians because the Galatians were Gauls. And there was Gauls in all those three countries. So we are got the same possibility of being, well, we're human, aren't we? And we need to be very much aware of the fact that there are people who get misunderstood or have misunderstandings, as we read in that song, misunder um, meanings that you never attended. Now, it doesn't matter who's preaching, whether it's me or Alan or Richard or Albert or Billy Graham. We have no authority. The only authority that we have is the word of God. And in Acts chapter 17, the Bereans were, were commended because the Apostle Paul says these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word of God with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And each one of us, we need to be checking, no matter who's preaching, we need to be checking what does the Bible say. Let's not fall into the trap that the Galatians fell into. Let us search the scriptures to verify that what we are being told is true. And I really love to hear somebody come to me next Sunday and say, you know what you said about, well, I've heard that many times, or I've never seen it like that before. Well, I, I went home and I checked it out. And the Bible says... I'd love for someone to check out what I'm saying today, see what the Bible says, and then come and tell me, I checked it out, and this is what the Bible says. Now, you might tell me that what I've said is wrong. Or you might say, I've never seen it like that before, but this is what the Bible says. It's the Bible which is our, th our authority. And it doesn't matter how good a preacher comes in here. The Bible is their authority. And we need to double check what they are saying as well. And as I finish this morning, I'd like to finish by reading that same prayer again. As I sit down before you this morning with the Bible in front of me here, I pray that you'll help me to listen and to understand all that I hear. Protect me from words of the liar, deceptions that seem there from you, meanings you never intended. Give me wisdom to see what is true. And equip me today for the battle with strength and the armor of light, with the joy of the victor inside me to shine through the day and the night. Wash me with your living water. Feed me with your living word. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to do what I've heard. Thank you.